Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Virtual Student Experiences Season 2 webinar. Today's webinar will focus on NASA. If you guys are new to our program, Virtual Student Experiences is a pro bono initiative spearheaded for students by students. And we at Virtual Student Experiences want to be the inspiration for aspiration. Our goal is to give students around the world an opportunity to hear from professionals in their career industry of interest in a friendly and casual setting. And if you're a student that knows what you want to do in the future, we at VC want to encourage, allow, and connect to the professionals. And through VC, students are given the chance to decide if their career choice fits their personality, skills, and really overall interests. And through VC, you'll be given a chance to hear from a wide variety of guests from a wide variety of seniority levels. And to find out more information or to sign up to be notified about other webinars, you can visit our website at www.virtualstudentexperiences.com. But before we get started, I just want to let you all know how this is going to work. Firstly, I'm going to be asking our guest professional that I'll introduce in a second a series of base knowledge questions so that you can get a good idea of who he is and what he does. And if at any time you think of a question, feel free to post it in the community module and we'll get to it in the later part of the webinar. We highly recommend that you guys ask questions during this webinar because it's really an opportunity to get an answer right here, right now, instead of reading about it later on the internet. Now, just real quickly, introducing our core team of members, we have Becky, Gabby, Jonathan, Coco, Tommy, and Audrey. And without further ado, our guest for today is Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker started his education at UT Austin, where he obtained his bachelor's degree, Business Administration and Management. And following that, he started working for NASA, the Space Exploration and Research Agency. And with his plethora of knowledge and hardworking spirit, he worked his way up from being the controlling officer for the Space Shuttle Program to becoming the manager of operations support office at the Johnson Space Center, a place where many only dream of visiting. And Mr. Baker has also received the Small Business Advocate Award from the NASA Exceptional Service and the NASA Exceptional Service Medal from the NASA headquarters. So we're very happy to have you today here, Mr. Baker. Thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. I always uh, like the opportunity to talk about NASA. Awesome. Just to start us off, from, from your perspective, can you tell us what NASA is and how you got to work for them? Well, yeah, so uh, I could talk for uh, half an hour about just that. Uh, so first of all, I, I think most everyone knows that NASA is a, a U.S. government agency, which makes it a little different in, in well, uh, make, actually makes it a lot different in, in many ways than certainly a you know, a, a private uh, company corporation. And uh, uh, I, I do have an interesting story. And so, so let, me, let me make sure everyone understands too, because uh, even growing up, it took me a while to, to learn this. So even though I worked for NASA for, for many years and I'm, I'm still involved there, I'm, uh, we have a really nice uh, NASA Alumni League of, you know, ex former NASA employees. And we have lots of activities. We, uh, have, uh, at least we did before the, the shutdowns, uh, you know, monthly luncheons and breakfast and, and technical meetings. And I'm actually on the board of directors. Uh, I'm an officer on the board of directors of the NASA Alumni League. And all of that to say that I'm still very heavily involved, even though I did retire three years ago. But what I really was, was wanting to make sure everybody understood was that most people, of course, uh, think or assume that if you work for NASA, you're an engineer or a scientist or an astronaut or a doctor. And we certainly have lots of those, but I'm a business guy. Uh, you know, again, my, my uh, degree is, is in uh, business management. And so it, it actually wasn't uh, until I, and I, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about this. I, I grew up with NASA. Uh, uh, but when I went to, to college, actually, I started as a psychology major. <laughs> and after my freshman year, I decided, um, I'm not sure that that's going to be a career I want. So I changed to business. But it wasn't until my junior year or so that I, I finally realized that, wait a minute, you know, NASA has uh, business people, too. It's, it's not all engineers and scientists. And, and in fact, as it turns out, I, I checked some numbers not too long ago, and a little over 50% of NASA employees are engineers. That's by far the, the majority. But the next largest group uh, is uh, business people. We, we made up about 25%. 
And the other, you know, 20 to 25 percent are the scientists and doctors and uh, astronauts and uh, IT specialists, that kind of thing. But again, so so even though the majority of people who work at NASA are engineers, uh, about a, a fourth of them are business people, like like I was. And so now I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how I uh, got to to work there. But again, let me back up a little bit. Like I said, I, I grew up with NASA. So uh, we lived in South Houston and my my family moved to a little town called League City, which is about halfway between Houston and Galveston in 1960. And it just turned out, pure coincidence, very lucky for me, that a couple of years later, they built what was then called the Manned Spacecraft Center. It's now the Johnson Space Center just five miles from my house. And so uh, all the way back to the original seven astronauts, I mean, John Glenn, Alan Shepard, Scott Carpenter, Gordon Cooper, uh, who have all passed away now, by the way, uh, they moved in to the community to, to become, uh, you know, uh, NASA employees work as astronauts and, and trained for their flights. And so naturally their children moved here with them. And so all of a sudden I'm in middle school and literally the kids of the original seven astronauts are now my friends and classmates. And so all through middle school and then into high school and they kept hiring more astronaut classes. And so, uh, you know, probably the majority of my friends, either they were the child of an astronaut or one of their parents worked for NASA. And, 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 and I'm still, 50 years later, still friends with, with most of them, you know, uh, thank goodness for, for social media and, you know, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. It's so easy to stay in touch with them now. But uh, so anyway, even with all of that, when I went away to, to college, like I said, I started as a psychology major. I had no intention of uh, making a career at NASA, even though I, I, you know, again, grew up with and loved space and NASA. And like I said, I was probably a junior before I realized that that I could. And so I'll try to make a, a short, a long story short. But back then, now again, this was, you know, 45 years ago in the mid 70s. And the way you got a job with the government, for the most part, was you took you took exams, you know, tests. And they had what they called the professional and administrative career examination. And it was, it was supposedly pretty hard. Uh, I remember the first time I heard about it, the, uh, the people who uh, were talking about it had taken it and you get scores in six different uh, occupation areas or aptitudes, you know, trying to find the right fit for where you would, uh, you know, best uh, have a, a job with the government. And if you score less than, uh, 70 they just don't tell you what your score was uh, you know and, but again you get you get six six scores and um, some of them were saying yeah I didn't even you know, did, didn't even pass so uh, you know uh, I didn't get a score in one of those six areas and you know so I'm kind of anxious I'm like wow that, that sounds really hard <laughs> but you know that wasn't going to keep me from from taking the test and so I did and Believe it or not, and to this day, I still wonder, you know, did they mix me up with someone else? I, I scored four 100s and two 98s and, uh, of the six, six areas. And, and so the way it worked was uh, you filled, when you filled out the application to take the test, you, you put down, uh, you know, what part of the, the country or state or what cities you would be interested in and taking a job, I don't, I don't think you got to, to, to select what type of, of job. It was just the, you know, the area that, that you would be willing to move to. And again, I had grown up near uh, Houston. Uh, and so the way it works is when you take the test, they, they send your name, they pick the top, what I heard was they, they take the top three names and send that to the offices, the government offices in the areas that you selected. And so, as it turned out, about a month after I took the test, NASA sent me a letter and said, hey, would you like to come interview for a job? And, and of course, I'm like, wow, well, yeah, you know, can I, can I start tomorrow? 
And so, so I did, I came down and uh, one other interesting uh, bit of trivia is the guy I interviewed at NASA for my job was the father of one of my friends from high school. So, so back then that I'd like to think I got the job anyway, but you know, that certainly didn't, didn't hurt. And so 42 years later, I, it's funny, I, I tell people, I can't imagine anywhere on earth, <laughs> literally, I would have rather have worked than NASA and the, the Johnson Space Center. And so, uh, you know, that's why I stayed 42 years. I finally, I turned 65 and it's been in January, it'll be four years since I retired, but uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't change a bit of it. Awesome. And then I guess looking towards your education, can you speak to maybe the role that it played in your success and really how important and if it's important to go to a name school and get really good grades? Well, so what I should point out first about that is things have changed much more than you would have ever imagined in that 45 years. For example, when I was hired, again, it was based on my scores on a, a test, which I did very well on, uh, and did have a business degree, but th at least they, they had a, a, a couple of other uh, people too at the same time that I kind of went through some early training with. And one of them didn't even have a degree. You know, they, if, you, if you scored well enough on that test, if you showed the, uh, you know, an aptitude that was good enough, they would hire you. Now, now this person had, had some college courses. They, it wasn't like they had just gone straight from high school or anything, but, but they did not have a degree. Now, fast forward 45 years, and it's completely different. Uh, in fact, it, it really started changing even in the, the specifically the business world, which I can speak to much better than, than the engineering and science world. But uh, about, I would say 10 or 15 years ago, they made it more of a, I guess I would call it a requirement to be promoted to certain levels within the business offices that you had to have a degree. Uh, you know, even if you had been hired or grandfathered in or whatever, and you, you got a job without a degree, you could only be promoted to a certain level without a degree. And now it, it's kind of like with the astronauts, they're, they're all, the, the astronauts they hire are just incredibly talented and, and educated. Now, I would say that you, unless you have an MBA, when you try to get a job at NASA, you're gonna be at a disadvantage uh, compared to the other folks because I probably, the majority of, of uh, people hired at NASA into the business office today have an MBA and I don't. Uh, but again, you know, that's, that's a, another story. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Uh, I, Certainly for people in, interested today, you know, and students uh, at, at NASA and the business office and certainly other areas of NASA, uh, education is, is very important. Hmm. So it's sort of like a, a prerequisite uh, and it's really hard to get in without that master's. Uh, yes, I would, like I said, I would, it's not impossible, uh, especially if, because that's not the only criteria. But uh, again, you know, that's probably one of the first things uh, that, that's looked at is, is your level before they even talk to you, you know, is, is your, your level of education. And again, uh, it puts you at a little bit of an, certainly of a, uh, an advantage if you do have that uh, master's. And then I guess, can you speak to some things that maybe helped you to uh, prepare in college for entering into your job at NASA? Was it studying really hard for that test? Was it uh, joining a club, um, something like that? Um, you know, I guess I would like to say, uh, I, and, and I feel like I, I consider myself an extrovert. I didn't always, but uh, so I, I'm also, you, me, if you looked at my LinkedIn, I'm actually uh, an actor too. I, I, I act in community theater. I've done about 16 or 18 shows. Uh, comedies, uh, dramas, Shakespeare, uh, and, and so 
Um, I, I part of that to say that I, I try I did try to take advantage of every opportunity. I was in the Longhorn Band uh, at the University of Texas, and so I, uh, you know, and was in a actually a service fraternity, and so I think I think trying to uh, uh, again take advantage of every opportunity and and you know get out of your comfort zone and, and all of those things that I'm sure you've heard before are or I, I I I agree with those kind of things. And another thing I'll 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 take a little bit of a side tour here. Uh, it's certainly NASA related, but along those lines, you may have heard of Gene Kranz. He was a flight director basically the boss of mission control uh, when Apollo 11 landed on the moon. He's played in the Apollo 13 movie. He was, you know, kind of given credit for, for being the guy who saved the astronauts. And for the movie, he never said, it's interesting, he never said it himself, but in the movie, they created a line, failure is not an option. And so later he, he wrote his uh, autobiography and, and he titled it failure is not an option and every photo he signs failure is not an option and that and that sounds great and and certainly I would agree with that if human lives are at stake like they were for Apollo 13 failure is not an option but that only goes so far I, I you know I like to think that oh gosh no fail, failure is an option it, it's a requirement almost you know again um, and I'm sure you've heard this too if if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. Uh, and so I, I actually, I have two sons and I, and I tried to teach them that too. And, and boy, one of them especially, uh, uh, it, it, it seems to have sunk in. He, he uh, applied to MIT uh, and I thought, oh, wow, you know, that's, that school's really hard to get into. Are you sure, you know? And, and yeah, yeah, no, I, we visited there and he said, that's my favorite, that's where I wanna go. And he got in you know, early admission even. And he, he's got a, he got a master's in computer science from MIT and now he's a professional software engineer. But uh, uh, anyway, I, th I think that, again, kind of a long story, but, but I think, uh, you know, not being afraid to try something new, uh, not being afraid to fail, taking advantage of every opportunity that you can, uh, that's certainly the kind of thing that uh, they look for when they're selecting astronauts. Uh, is you know people who are well-rounded and, and lots of other things they're looking for too, but uh, they they want people that that are you know interested in doing a variety of things. Interesting. I guess can you talk about um, your time as the manager for the Johnson Space Center and maybe what your responsibilities were and the different types of skills that you used in that position? Okay, so. I want to make sure you understand. I, I was the manager of an operations support office. I was not the manager of the Johnson Space Center, right? <laughs> Actually, uh, that's generally an astronaut who was, for most of the time I was there, uh, the director of the Johnson Space Center was a, you know, a, a retired astronaut. But so, so about half, and so again, 42 years, that's a long time. But about the, the first half of it, I was, uh, contract specialist, contracting officer, basically, you know, buying things, managing contracts. It was the last half, the last 20 years or so, I became a, a deputy manager and a manager. And so, it, you know, the responsibilities change, as, as you can guess, I'm sure, quite a lot from, from doing the, the kind of the day-to-day the -day grind and work and, and uh, 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 you know, producing products as opposed to being a manager where suddenly it's much more of a people job and, uh, you know, uh, making assignments and, and uh, you know, deciding who to promote and who not. And, and you know, even at, even at NASA, you know, everyone's not perfect and, and you know, there are personnel problems that you have to, to deal with. And, and, uh, uh, in fact, I would say, you know, sometimes people ask me, and I, maybe you were going to get to this question, you know, what was one of the most difficult things I had to deal with? And certainly as a manager, it was uh, have, trying to, to divide up and allocate the workload so that 
we had so we could get it all done. You know, again, uh, NASA is a government agency, and and uh, so we, we don't have to worry about profit and and uh, that kind of thing. But we did have a budget, and and we had to live within it, and it was not a huge budget. You know, NASA would prefer spending their money on flying to space and buying spacecraft and experiments and things as opposed to paying salaries of, of people. And so, so it was quite often surprisingly to me, actually, uh, the, how, how difficult it would get given the workload that we were asked, asked to do compared to the number of people we had. And I remember the, in, even the, the last few years of my career there, uh, some of the most difficult conversations I would have was, and, and you know, the workload would fluctuate, right? Sometimes it's heavy and then it, it kind of eases up and then it becomes heavy again and then ease, and, and it depends on which office you're in. And, and so I remember uh, at one point, I just had too much to do. I didn't have enough people. And so I had to basically beg another manager in another office Hey, can you spare a couple of? Because I I kind of knew that she was in a little bit of a lull, you know. Can you spare a couple of people to get me over this hump? And so she could. She she gave me a, a, a two people, <laughs> and of course one of them was uh, not the greatest worker in the world. So that that was its own problem. Uh, but again, all all of that to say that, you know, the it, it's it was much more of a a people. Uh, human relations kind of job, but and so a lot of times I I would think to myself, boy, I miss the, you know, the awarding and managing and negotiating and writing the contracts. And now I I, I spend my whole day, uh, you know, managing people and and not uh, not buying things for NASA. And I guess it, it's kind of cool to see to work at NASA and get to see your um, work in the projects that you work on actually be deployed and executed. And can you tell us about a time when, I guess you got to see one of the projects that you worked on um, or one of the pieces that you got to buy go into action? Oh, I'd love to tell you that. In fact, I'm, I'm ready for that. So believe it or not, so this uh, space shuttle, of course, I started at NASA in 1975 and the first space shuttle flight was 1981. So it was kind of already in the early stages. Uh, we had already awarded a contract to Rockwell International to, to build the space shuttle orbiters. That was one contract for the orbiters. There were, the whole space shuttle system was larger. There was a, a separate contract for the external tank, which had the uh, uh, fuel for the, main engines. So that was a contract for the tanks, another contract for the main engines, another contract for the two solid rocket boosters. But I got to work on, it, of course, it wasn't just me. It was, it was an office of about five or six of us. I got to work on the office, in the office to buy the space shuttle orbiters. And so, you know, $2 billion each, it was a, a $16 billion contract. Uh, counting the cost for the design and development and test and and all of that and so I once about once a month I traveled from Houston to Downey California where the Rockwell plant was and they were uh, they actually built the orbiters uh, in Palmdale California it was about an hour away but the 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 main business offices were there in Downey which is very near the you know central part of Los Angeles and so so anyway yeah that's that's the best thing right I mean I you know I, I got to see the space shuttles that I that I that I can say I bought <laughs> fly in space and, and I, I will say so so I my whole my career covered the entirety of the the shuttle program I, I started there six years before the first flight and I actually left six years after the last flight 135 flights. I only got to see one launch. Uh, so I, you know, kind of, kind of. I, I won't say, I won't say reg regret it, but I, I wish I could have seen more. But that was, that was quite an experience. I have to spend just a few seconds telling you about that. So, so I'm sure you know that light travels faster than sound waves. And so, if you watch a space shuttle launch, 
the closest you can get is about three miles away from the launch pad. And so when it leaves the launch pad, the first thing is you see it. And then a few seconds later, you hear it. And then a few seconds after that, you literally feel it. The ground actually would start vibrating from three miles away. There's a YouTube video of a space shuttle launch and their car is parked there. You can hear car alarms going off because the ground is, is shaking enough to set off the car alarm. So that was, that was quite an experience. Oh, awesome. And then I guess just to close our portion out on VSC side before we move into the student questions, can you give us just some final words of uh, wisdom and suggestions for students that are aspiring to work at NASA? Uh, sure, I can, I can think of a few things. Um, so teamwork is hopefully if you're going to uh, try to work at NASA, you can work well with teams because NASA does so much with teams. And I, I, I mean, astronaut crews are, are teams. And uh, it, it seemed like almost everything we did was we formed a team to, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to take care of the, the whatever we were, were trying to do. And um, so that, that, that's certainly important. Um, having confidence, and, and you know, that's easy to say. I know it's hard to, to try to sell something. You need to have more confidence. But, but I say that because one of the things they, that NASA tries to do, and it's kind of a lesson we learned over you know, 60 years and three accidents where we lost 17 astronauts, is, is speaking up and you know, uh, not being afraid. If you've got a, an issue or a concern or a question or you think something's not right, you, you need to, to say it, you need to tell somebody. And even if you're a, you know, a junior person in a meeting and, and uh, uh, you, know, you, you, you feel maybe intimidated, if it's that important, you need to, you need to be able to, to, to say it. And you know, I guess one of the things I, I think that personally uh, worked for me, I, I like to think I was resourceful. <laughs> and and I have a couple of examples of that. One is the and you you may enjoy hearing this. You know you're you're all young enough. You cut and paste. You know on a on a computer. Well, I did I did the real cut and pasting. You know back before we had personal computers and printers and word processors and and if we had a a document we needed to have prepared, we would write it out by hand and take it to a typing pool and put it in their, their basket. And two or three days later, we would get the document back. Hopefully it didn't have too many typos in it, but whether it did or not, if we needed to change it then, you know, we, we didn't want to mark it up and take it back and put it in the, the, the bin and wait three more days. And so I became really good at literally you know, if I if I wanted to add a paragraph or remove a paragraph or just change it, and I and I could type actually. I actually took luckily one of the luckiest things I ever did was take type by accident was take typing in high school, and so if I wanted to change something, I could I could type it out on a piece of paper, and I would you know could literally then cut the existing document, and remove the part I wanted to either move or or delete, and then and then paste or tape the new part and then I could put it on a, a you know photocopier and do it so that when I printed the photocopy you couldn't even tell that I had made a change and so you know that saved me lots of time and then real quickly the other thing was I wanted to, to talk about which I was was kind of proud of was that so we didn't get personal computers at NASA on our desktop until 1984, and I've already been there for you know nine years. Uh, but then I, I spent 10 years at NASA headquarters. And that was about the time that uh, we we the personal computers were becoming kind of routine, and 
and we were we were going from DOS, you know, that was before your time, the, the original disk operating system before we had Windows. And mm -hmm. so Windows 3.1 came along in the early 90s. And I decided to, I, I wanted to, to learn everything I could. It wasn't part of my job. Everything I could about computers and operating right. systems and Windows. And so I, I did that in my spare time and I got so good at it that I became the unofficial help desk for my office at NASA headquarters. If, if someone had a problem with the software or the computer wouldn't work or they needed to have memory added or whatever, they didn't call the help desk, they just called me. And uh, you know, I was almost always able to fix it. And of course I was able to take care of myself too. So I, I think that, and that kind of, <laughs> kind of carried on you know, till the time I left, I, I actually did build a, a, the f first time my, my youngest son wanted a, a desktop, he said, uh, hey, let's, let's just build it instead of buying it. And I thought, oh, gosh, really? And, you know, I thought about it some more. I said, yeah, let's, because I had never actually built one from the, you know, the, the ground up, so to speak. But we did, and it worked fine, uh, you know, five or six, eight, ten years. And, uh, uh, so that was that was a, a skill I you know enjoyed basically my whole life. Awesome. Um, yeah, thank you so much for answering at least our questions here at VC. And then I think we have one student question, um, which is from Angelica, and she asks, "I'm currently an aviation management major with the career goal of becoming a commercial pilot. What are the aviation slash pilot positions or opportunities through NASA?" <sighs> Well, um, not, not, not that many, really. Uh, no, I mean, uh, assuming you're not talking about an astronaut, because a lot of our astronauts are, are pilots or former pilots, but we do have uh, aircraft. In fact, the last thing, that's another long story. The, one of the, the last big thing I did before I retired was we needed a new airplane to go to Russia to pick up our astronauts when they landed there after coming home from uh, you know six months on the ISS. Uh, you know, thankfully now we're starting to get uh, SpaceX and maybe Boeing soon uh, ferrying our astronauts back and forth. But still now and and for back then, they had to take off from Russia and land in Russia, and the airplane that we had was getting old and it had to make multiple stops. It didn't have that much of a range. And so we needed a new one. And so again, I'll, I'll make it short. I, I, my, my last task was to buy another airplane uh, to bring the astronauts home. And so I, I was responsible. I was what they call the source selection official uh, to buy a Gulfstream 5. Uh, and so we certainly have uh, you know, an aircraft operation, but the uh, the the the, the uh, pilots who fly that airplane and the other airplanes we have, and the mechanics who work on them are actually contractors. We have we hire uh, another one of the things that my office <laughs> actually uh, did was award a contract to, and you know, we renew it every five years to a company who's responsible for basically running our aircraft operations at Ellington Aircraft, which is uh, very near the, the Johnson Space Center. So, so you really wouldn't be a NASA employee if you were you know, a, a pilot flying one of those, you know, not, a, not flying a shuttle, but flying one of those uh, regular NASA aircraft. Hmm. I hope that's helpful. Awesome. Oh yeah, um, most definitely, I think the, I mean, summarized, it sounds like uh, all of the pilots are either astronauts or they are um, contractors hired to ferry um, pilots to and from launch sites. Well, well yeah, yeah. Or, or they do other things. We, we have some research aircraft, too. They don't all, it's not nothing but going to Russia and back. Uh, we have some, uh, I don't know if they're familiar, WB-57, which are high altitude aircraft, which uh, uh, you know, do research and and uh, actually, our, our, we we still have our Gulfstream three and our Gulfstream five also are outfitted to do other 
uh, environmental uh, kind of research? Yeah, well, thank you so much for answering that question. Um, just to close this off, I just want to say thank you so much again for just taking the time to talk with us here at BAC. And I'm sure the students that were here have been able to really learn a lot from you and your experiences. And I'm sure that the students that will also view this later will be able to even learn more from your experiences and what you've been able to share with us here today. So I'm very grateful that to, for that. So thank you very much. Pleasure. Awesome. Thank you. And have a nice rest of your night.